When I consider the trajectory of human evolution, I see us moving towards a reality in which we come to see ourselves as members of a single human race with the earth as our common homeland. We've come a long way from caves and tribes. For thousands of years, women suffered oppression as second-class humans, and that includes in the Christian church. There are many societies today where there remains tragically true. Yet on the worldwide level, the concept of equality of the sexes has assumed the force of near universally evolving principle. We're coming closer and closer. Nationalism is in retreat. Although much of it is still too virile in too many places, the United Nations stands as a testament to the potential we have to subordinate national interest to universal good. The fetish of absolute national sovereignty is in retreat. Racial and ethnic prejudice, which made such a heavy mark on the past century, have been exposed as the horrors that we now nearly universally consider spiritual diseases. Prejudices of ethnicity, gender, nation, caste, and class persist. But I submit we have passed a threshold in human consciousness that slowly but surely will lead us to new orders of human relationship which will bring relief to the oppressed. The, the idea of, of the human race evolving is, is uh, I think it's becoming more and more, I mean talking about not just physically but in lots of ways is more and more accepted. This trajectory of progress of which I speak is slow but I believe it's certain. One major obstacle in the way of such progress is organized religion which has for too long lent its credibility to fanaticism. Fundamentalist religion of all stripes and denominations lends fuel to the fire of ethnic, racial, and national division. Religious claims of exclusivity and the sanction of God of each religion's narrow vision welded to political power leads inevitably to conflict. If you, put, if you give religious people a militia, religious fundamentalists a militia, that's when the trouble really starts. 30% of the entire population of Europe was wiped out in the 16th century by wars of religion between Catholics and Protestants. 30%. Everybody living in Europe was murdered in the, in the 16th century by Catholics and Protestants fighting each other. Britain's chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, said, and I'm quoting, globalization is bringing us closer together while a hostile tribalism is driving us apart. Globalization is bringing us together. Tribalism is trying to push us apart. We have just enough religion to hate each other, but not enough to make us love one another. Racial, radical fundamentalist religion when allied with military might, adds up to violence and death. I always said, I've always said, thank God that in this country, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robinson didn't have militia because I would have been dead a long time ago. Remember, every disaster they blamed on homosexuals, they kill them. Well, luckily they didn't have militia. This is nowhere today more apparent than in the Middle East, where Israelis and Palestinians are locked in a mutually destructive downward spiral. The history of the conflict is a story of two tragedies. Both, both the Israelis and the Palestinians are stuck in tragedy. The tragedy suffered by the Palestinian, Palestinian people is the uprooting from home and lands created more than, creating more than 70 years of exile as refugees for the majority of them and bitter occupation for others. The tragedy suffered by the Israelis is the fear and uncertainty in which they live in a Jewish state, a state made necessary 2000, after 2,000 years of pogroms, holocaust, committed on the people of the diaspora. They, they created Israel in order a small, safe place for Jews so we could stop slaughtering them, which we had been doing for 3,000 years. 
In the words of Brian McCarthy, they will escape this mutual destruction, they, the Palestinians and, and the Jews, when they learn to transcend their tribalisms, to recognize the collective other with its essential human dignity and inalienable rights, end quote. What, mon- what must come first underlying any authentic search for a political solution is a deeper change of attitude toward each other, repentance. Both sides need to admit their faults and repent. There are not two different truths about what is actually happening. It must be pieced together and told as a common, one coherent story, communicated across two communities. Knowing a common story of the past is an essential first step in fitting the two halves of the puzzle into one picture of two people who must learn to live together in one land. The greatest single antidote to violence is conversation, says Rabbi Sachs, speaking our fears, listening to the fears of others, and thus discovering the genesis of hope. The genesis of hope, a common story. What would that look like? What would a common story look like? According to oral tradition, 4,000 years ago, a man named Abraham was a human vehicle for God, for God to bring the, God's chosen people and to bring God's love into the world. So God chose the Jews as the vehicle for him to come into the world. Keep the covenant I give you, and from you will come a great nation, and you will be blessed. This is what God promised Israel. Because of his wife Sarah was believed to be barren, Abraham, in order to leave descendants, okay, so God says you're going to father a great nation. His wife, is, his wife is past birthing age. So in order to father his son, Ishmael, he took, he slept with a slave girl, Hagar, who was an Egyptian. So he, he fathered a son, Ishmael. Thirteen years later, Sarah, very late, actually like it, according to the Bible, she was like 90 or something, way past childbearing years, gives miraculous birth to a son named Isaac. Okay, Isaac and Ishmael. One would be the son born of a slave girl and one of his wife. How to fear that Ishmael, the oldest son, would inherit the patrimony. So the mother, the mother was afraid that, you know, if, if Abraham, when Abraham dies, Ishmael will get the son of the slave, will, will inherit the patrimony. So what they do is they, they took, the, they took Hagar, Hagar, the woman, and the, ki- the kid, Ishmael, out into the desert to let him die. What? No water, no food, nothing. Just brought him out and left them there. The idea was let him die, and then Isaac will inherit the patrimony. When the water runs out, Hagar places Ishmael in the shade of a bush and cries out to God for mercy. An angel appears to Hagar, telling her to hold her son close, that someday he would be the patriarch of a great nation. Hagar then sees a well nearby and they are saved. Abraham's son Ishmael becomes the father of the Arabs, Arab nations. Isaac, the son of Sarah and Abraham, becomes the father of the Jewish nation. Arabs and Jews are cousins. Abraham becomes the progenitor of both Jews and, Ab- Jews and Abrahams. Now, Muhammad, in the seventh century, proclaimed Abraham. So, you know, Islam was started in the 600s. So, Muhammad says Abraham was the first Muslim. What is a Muslim? A Muslim is the person who submits himself fully to the will of God. What did Abraham do? God says, go off and, and, and you know, you know, we'll tell you where to go. Well, he submitted to the will of God. He was the first Muslim. This is what Muhammad teaches. In the first century AD, the Christians proclaimed the new covenant, tracing their spiritual heritage back to Abraham. So the Muslims, the Christians, Jews, they all trace the heritage back to Abraham. So today, Three great faiths can speak of the Abrahamic tradition, in which they all have roots, their common story, and one man, Abraham. 
and he's, become, he's come to be revered by all the religions. He is the patriarch of the Jewish Old Testament. He is a spiritual force for the New Testament of the Christian faith, and he is the architect of Islam. I want to read from the Quran. The Quran doesn't have books and chapters like the Bible does. It has surahs, S-U-R-A-H. So this is surah 2, and they're arranged in order of length. So second surah is second longest, and then verses. So this is surah 2, verse 136. Say ye. So this would be, this would be the angel talking to, to Muhammad and, and telling him what to say, what to proclaim. Say ye. We believe in God, in Allah. God, Allah is the word for God. We believe in God, in the revelation given to us, and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus. This is the Quran. That's what they must, mustn't believe. And that given to all prophets from their Lord, we make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to God in Islam, in submission. No difference. Now, according to Muslim tradition, when Ishmael was in the desert, so they take him out there to die, his father Abraham, but, the, but he survived and he's living in the desert, so his father Abraham came to visit him in the desert. Together they built the first temple to the one living God. Allah is just the Arabic word for God. Today that temple is called the Kabla. So when you see pictures of, on television of people going on pilgrimage and walking around the black cube, that's, the, that's what Abraham and Ishmael built, the first temple in, in Muslim tradition. According to Muslim in tradition, Isaac and Ishmael become partners in Hagar and say Sarah become allies. This is, in, this is in the Quran. According to Jewish scripture, and this is in the Old Testament, Isaac and Ishmael were reconciled. These are the words from Genesis chapter 25, verses 10 through 10. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now here it is, Isaac and Ishmael, Arab, Jew. His sons buried him together in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron. Isaac and Ishmael, Jew and Arab, Arab half-brothers, sons of Abraham, reconciled and together honored their father in death. This is in, the, this is in our Bible, the, the Jewish Bible. In the words of the Quran, you, humankind, we have created you as a single family and made you into nations and tribes that you might come to know one another that you might come, to, not to separate you, but so you can come to know each other. Today, what is needed is a return to that common story, acknowledgement of common roots, and the spirit of Isaac and Ishmael, reconciliation. Arabs and Jews are cousins who today are engaged in a deadly family feud in the desert. I want to share a story with you from Christian tradition, a story told in the book of John, chapter 4. Joshua bin Yosef, that's Jesus, that's the Jewish name for, you know, Jesus is the Latin. Joshua bin Joseph, that was Jesus' name. Traveling with his disciples, journeys into the wilderness. Tired from his journey, alone because the others have gone ahead to purchase food, he sits down at Jacob's well. He has no cup or bucket with which to draw water. A woman appears carrying a bucket. She is a divorced woman with a shady past. She is a Samaritan, and thereby an enemy of the Jews. By custom, Jesus is not allowed to even speak to her in public. These strangers, these enemies, discovered at the well that they need each other. He needs a cup of water in order to survive the noonday heat. She is in need of affirmation. She's an outcast. She has been shunned. She has been shunned and is her own is on her own to survive and provide her basic needs. Back in those days, when you shun somebody, you couldn't help them. You couldn't feed them. You couldn't help them. In a strict patriarchal society, she has no father, no husband, no brother or son to look after her. She is seeking grace. He is seeking water. He drinks from her cup. They are transfigured in the light of the noonday sun, 
and each enemy sees in the face of the other that of a friend. Distance dissolved into relationship, enmity, into mutuality. They experience spiritual wholeness, a healing reality. Jew and Samaritan, thereby separated, both descendant from Jacob, thereby connected. This story tells the truth of our interdependent, interdependent existence. It tells the truth that all barriers between us are superficial. All barriers are superficial. It shows us that we have to learn about each other, learn the truth of each other, affirm our common story, and know that we need each other. True worship takes place in relationship which transcends, transcends all human artifice. I began this message by claiming that religion has been the source of much suffering and violence in our world. But that is only half of the story. When people of religion remain faithful to the teaching and spirit of their great spiritual founders and leaders, it empowers them great capacities to love, forgive, and create, to dare greatly, to overcome prejudice, to sacrifice for the common good, and to choose the impulse to do good over, to do good over evil. Good over evil. When, when, when churches teach, for example, homosexuals are going to hell, they're not, they're not quoting Jesus. They're, it's, it's bad scripture. That's just one example. There's lots of places. If you, follow the, if you follow the teachings of the leaders of all the religions, Muhammad, Abraham, all the prophets, Jesus, it preaches love, it preaches love for each other. Where the problem comes in is when, when, you, when, you, when you create rituals and dogma that exclude people, and, and if, you don't do, if you don't believe this, you're bad. The truth underlying all religions is, it, is that all, all religions teach one truth. There are, of course, wide differences among the world's major religions with respect to social ordinances, for example, veiling of women. That's a... That's not, in the, that's not a Quranic thing, it's, it's social, it's a social thing, that separates people. Catholic Church used, church used to require women to wear veils to church, you know, black hats and, and veils to church. Forms of worship, that, that's cultural, it's, it's not biblical. There are vast cultural differences. One reason why I had a hard time studying Islam is because I, the images in Islam, you know, if you read the, the Bible, it's West, things that were used to Western things. But camels and dates don't do it for me. You know, that, it, it, that doesn't do it for me. And this is one of the problems we have. It's the cultural differences. We must love one another as ourselves. We must serve one another. This is the teaching of all religions. But Jesus did not, did not come up with the idea of love one another. That was in Jewish scripture. It's in, it's in other religions also. Jesus taught it, but, he, but he's teaching what all religions teach. We must treat one another as we would have them treat us. That's all religions teach that. Beyond all diversity of cultural expression and human interpretation, religion is one. What is required is that each religion give up its exclusivist claims. What is required is mutual respect and toleration. There are as many paths to wholeness as there are people on this planet. That, of course, is a, that's a, that's a core Buddhist teaching, that there are many as many paths to enlightenment as there are people. You find your own path to enlightenment. It's also the Protestant ideal that each person stands before God and, and finds their way. The key to the healing power of religion is to remember our common story and the oneness of truth at the core of all religion. Five members of the kibbutz Metzer in Israel were murdered in an attack by Palestinian militants. The kibbutz had before that long standing, had before that had long standing good relations with its Arab neighbors. Dora Lieber, manager of the kibbutz, said to this, said, I'm quoting the, the leader of the kibbutz after the attack, we will not stop in believing in coexistence and compromise in giving life a chance. If you're trying to divide us by killing some of us, it's not going to work. I gave a sermon here on Islam 10 years ago and mentioned the violence occurring in the Middle East. A visitor to this church 10 years ago came up to me after the service and told me, I am a Jew, and I have a daughter living in Israel 
within a mile of the West Bank. She collects clothing from her friends once a week. She drives to the Arab quarters and distributes clothing to needy people. Ekrem Haq is a Muslim living right over here in Raleigh. After the attacks in, in 9-11, and, and people, a lot of people wanted to blame Muslims for the attacks and, and wanted to isolate and, and ostracize Muslims. Ekram Haq in Raleigh said this, In Islam, Jesus is a towering personality. So are Moses and Abraham. Muslims traditionally invoke God's peace and blessing on them when their names are mentioned. Many Muslims have named their children Jesus, Esau, E-S-A-A, but that's Jesus and Muslim. Musa for Moses, and Abraham, Abraham. In the Quran, a chapter is named Maryam, after Mary. There's a chapter in the Quran, Mary, after the mother of Jesus. I have named one of my daughters Maryam, end quote. During the time, this is, so here's some of the things I think we can do. After, after 9-11, I knew almost nothing about Islam. So after 9-11, I said, I'm going, to learn a lot. I'm going to learn about this. And part of my learning was to try to share in, in, in the worship communities of the different faiths, to visit the mosque and to, and to read the Quran and so forth. So here's some things you can do. During, during but it's kind of, you know, Ramadan, it, Islam has a 10-month cycle, so it's kind of hard. Ramadan is different, different time of year every year, so it's kind of hard to follow. But take a day, take a day during Ramadan and fast, and, you know, and, and uh, along with them, and, and read the Quran. Uh, during the time of Hanukkah, light candles with your family. Hanukkah is a, is a tradition you do in the, fa in the family, so you light your candles around, around with your family. During Advent, leading up to Christmas, light a candle in the darkness and contemplate how hope grows in the darkness and arises from the ashes of despair. This, the Quran I read from, by the way, if you, if you want to read the Quran, don't, don't do the, what a lot of people do, say read the Bible. If you read the Bible, forget it. Unless you have a good commentary or you know, have a good translation. This Quran, if you want to look at it afterwards, I highly recommend this. It's, it's got commentary and it's a good translation. In 1993, the children of our church wrote a poem. I'm going to close with that poem. Who here was a child in our church in 1993? Are there any here? How old were the tax kids? How old were you in 1993? How, how old were you? Huh? How old were you? You were born in 1984? Oh, negative four, okay. By the way, by the way, uh, Jesus was born 4 B.C. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the kids, <laughs> the kids of our church wrote this poem, and I'll close with this poem. This is like young kids. Dur during this season, this, by the way, was a season. At this, at this, the year I gave this sermon, it was the year of Ramadan and Hanukkah and Advent all at the same time. So the kids wrote this poem. During this season of love, Please help the children of the world to be loved. Help protect them from sickness. Please help the ch children learn to read and write and get along with each other. Please help the children to decide what they think is right. Don't ignore them. <laughs> Choke it up. <coughs> Give them adults <coughs> who can set good examples so they will have someone to follow. Help them to grow in a world of peace. Our kids. Amen. <laughs>